Bruchim Aboim. Thank you for coming. The um, class today will be on a very Jewish topic, food. Uh, we finished off last week's with uh, exercise and uh, basically, you know, you can exercise all you want, but it still boils down to calories and food choices, uh, healthy physical choices. And so too when it comes to spirituality. Basically, you are what you eat. So, kosher food cultivates uh, spirituality in the body. And non-kosher food, secular desires in the body. And uh, there are examples of this both in the Torah and in life. Uh, when the Jews were in the desert, you know, they asked for meat. They complained to Moses, to Moshe. And um, God gave them quail which was bird, and they didn't seem to complain. And um, there's a deeper meaning that the rabbis say that when they asked for meat, that they were eating the man, a spiritual food, and this didn't give them the desire to procreate, to have relations. So they wanted something that would make them more animalistic. And they asked for meat, because that is the most animalistic, most coarse of all foods, connected to the ground. As we know, that animals, just like man, were created from the dust of the earth. And God said to you that, yes, you may want that desire, but you don't need to be that coarse, that birds were made both from water and from earth, mud, and that you can have something like that, that'll still give you a desire for procreation. So God gave them quail, and this they accepted to uh, give them their desires. As we see, they didn't ask for fish, because fish live in Mayim, which is water. And again, the most spiritual of all, connected, Mayim is connected water to Torah. In fact, that's why a fish doesn't need any time, type of, spirit, of, of, of uh, sacrificial uh, killing in the sense of shechita, slaughtering. Um, no ritual done to it. You can take it out of the water. Its blood is okay. There's nothing about it. Whereas a bird, you have to cut one of the the trachea or the esophagus, and again has to be shechted with as by a slaughterer and a, an animal, both the trachea and the esophagus, more connected to the ground. So again, so we see that the food has spiritual connections to it. Also, we see that there's the strange phenomenon of what we call the Asha Shafas Toar that we have in the Torah. If a man sees a beautiful woman in battle about whether he can take her as a wife or not, which is very strange because the Jewish army was really made up of righteous individuals. And why would someone in the middle of doing a righteous deed of fighting for the land of Israel find this desire to be with a non-Jewish woman uh, who was there to be provocative and to distract him? And the Jewish army was different. You know, the Romans eat, drink, and be merry tomorrow we die, what the Romans would do is they would have a party before the battle. And in the morning they would kill all the field whores. And then they would tell the men, if you want to have relations again, you're going to have to go capture the city. That was part of the uh, hook that they got to make them fight a little harder, um, their desire. Um, whereas in the Jewish army, what was done is before battle they would fast. As we see with the story of, uh, of Purim. Again, that the fast day of Pinus Esther is really the fast of the battle before the Jews fought. Um, and so this soldier in battle, if he finds himself famished, can eat anything he wants because, again, it's a matter of life and death. And it may well be that he's eaten something that's non-kosher. This, this affects his body and his mind. And therefore, he may look at this woman and find a desire for her. And we see that the antidote to this is to detox. He takes her to his house for 30 days, and 30 days seems to be the amount of time that it takes to change over your body matter. And if he still has a desire, then it's a spiritual longing. But generally speaking, they feel that after 30 days, he'll see the errors of his ways and see that it was just something that was more of a physical desire, and then he will let her go. And again, from this we also see on a very practical level, whenever you change your diet, don't do it right away, gradually come into it over a period of time. Torah says 30 days, which is also a good idea, so you don't turn your whole digestive tract into turmoil by changing your diet right away. There's also a book called the Kuzari 
It was written by Yehuda ben Levi of a Muslim and a priest and a rabbi who are talking to the king of the Khuzars. And he's trying to find what religion to go to. So the rabbi is talking to the um, king and he's telling him that there are not just four categories of mineral, vegetable, animal, and man, but there's a fifth category called the Jew. And what he was explaining to the king was that, for example, if you take a dog who goes into a dump and eats out of a garbage can, and after he eats to his fill, he drinks in a puddle that's on the ground, the dog will be fine. His digestive tract can handle all of that. If a man were to eat exactly the same thing the dog what made the dog healthy, a man would die. And on a spiritual level, there is that distinction between a new and a Jew and a non-Jew. Because to say that, for example, that shrimp and lobster, surf and turf, isn't healthy, we can't say that. These football players look pretty healthy. But on a spiritual level, that which is healthy for a non-Jew is spiritually poisoned to a Jew. And that's what the Rishu Malevi told the king of the Khuzars, that there's a spiritual f a bill, a form to food that we don't quite understand, but at the same time will affect the Jew in a totally different way. There was a rabbi called Reb Chaim of Sanz, and he, he claimed that this enlightened movement, Jews having ideas of heretical thoughts, of moving away from strict Orthodox Judaism, came about by unethical shoked him, people who were ritual slaughterers, who allowed non-kosher meat to be eaten by people thinking it was kosher. And even though they did it unknowingly, still this put thoughts in their mind and became that impetus which was able to create this enlightened movement. Now the Chayza says, Chosa Lublin, it was once told about a tzaddik, a certain individual, who fasted from one Shabbat to the next, from one week to the other. And he said on the verse that's in the, in the verse of Ayikra, it says, Lahara o lahetiv, concerning an oath for good or for bad, to do evil or to do good. And the Gemara in Shvua states that Lahara to evil means to not eat, and lahetiv to good means to eat. So there are two ways that a person can serve God through bodily afflictions and through eating through bodily afflictions, and the second way is through eating and elevating the, the food to a higher level. And without a doubt, it's much better, lehative, to eat. And with this, we can understand the words in Yirmiyahu, where it states, Chachamim Hemalara, that to say, the sages know the way of evil, which means not to eat, fasting. However, lehative lo yadu. But the good way they do not know is to serve God through eating, and this they do not know based on Ituri Torah. In fact, we see that we have two holidays, one called Purim and Yom Kippur. Yom Kippurim. It's a day like Purim, Yom Kippur. And that on Purim, uh, the mitzvah is to eat. And on Yom Kippur, the mitzvah is to fast. And we see that a person can do much more by eating properly than he can by fasting. So we learn that the food is a tool for us to come closer to God. In fact, the, um, on Shabbat we receive what's called a neshama yaseira, an extra soul that accompanies us through the whole of the Shabbat. And that soul is connected to food. In fact, it's considered to be insatiable. That's why on Shabbat we have a greater appetite. In fact, there's a story told of uh, Antoninus, the emperor of Rome, who was uh, a great uh, associate of, Re of Rebbe, who edited the Mishnah, a great rabbi. And um, he ate a meal with him on the Shabbat, and then he came and had a weekday meal. And the Shabbat meal was cold. When he came on the weekday, the emperor said to Rebbe, I don't want to complain, but the food really isn't as tasty as it was the last time I was here. And it's strange, because the meal was cold. And uh, the Rebbe said, there's a spice missing. And he said, well, if there's a spice, we'll send it to my kitchen. The royal kitchen has everything. I can give you whatever you need. He says, no, the spice that's missing is the Shabbat. That adds a flavor to everything. So again, there's a spiritual addition to all food. Now, food is a necessity of life. And it's something that is desirable. And the problem is that we 
live to eat instead of eat to live. And one of the problems that we have, especially as Jews, is we eat with our eyes. And when a person eats with his eyes, it's insatiable. So where does this come from, this fact that Jews are, eat with their eyes? And it really goes back to the man, the spiritual food that they ate for 40 years in the desert. Because what it was is a spiritual food that was totally absorbed in the body. They did not, not eliminate anything. And everyone had about two quarts, the same amount. And what it did is it satisfied a person, but it didn't look like a lie. So even though it satisfied their bodily needs, it didn't satisfy their desire. And so the look of the eye wasn't full enough. And that becomes something with Jews, that first we eat with our eyes. And if it doesn't look a knife, in fact, there's a saying that says that a blind person is never satisfied because he can't see his food. And therefore, there's always a desire. Um, also, with food, it creates a situation where we have to use discipline. It's one of the desires of the, of the world. God made three things pleasurable, and that is uh, procreation. And it's really not meant for recreation. It was meant to have children. But if it wouldn't be desirable, people wouldn't do it. Sleep. Again, necessity to let the body rejuvenate itself. And again, something that we overdo. And food. Uh, you see people that are on an IV for a while. They don't really want to eat. Chewing is difficult. Swallowing is painful. And yet, we overdo all three of them. So one of the things that we have to learn to do with food is discipline, especially today with the amount of food that's available. In fact, there's a uh, story told uh, of a uh, rabbi who had a young man stay with him. And in the morning after davening, he, he cooked the young man a breakfast that included eggs and lox and pastries and all types of things. And the uh, young man polished off everything. And the next morning on the way to services, the old rabbi told the young man, uh, you really shouldn't be such a glutton. And the, uh, when they came back from, this, from prayer, the rabbi again prepared a meal for the young man of the omelets and the, and the uh, toast and the lox and all of the uh, things that go with it, with pastries, whatever. It was a great meal. And again, the young man polished it off. And the next day, again, the rabbi said to the young man, you shouldn't be such a glutton. And the young man said to the rabbi, I don't understand, you made it. If you don't want me to eat it, don't make it. And the rabbi said, you don't understand. We have two different jobs here. My mitzvah, my deed, is to serve you even more than you can eat. Yours is to push away and say no. So we both have two different things here. And so basically, the blessing that we have for eating is v'yachalta v'savata. And when a person eats, he should be sated. And that's really the key, the discipline to be able to walk away from a table, even though there's food there, without eating everything, without being stuffed, but with, but with being sated. Eating healthy not only for the body, but also for the mind and for the soul. The Rambam says, who was a doctor to the sultan, even in his time, the Rambam lived in the 1100s, late, late 10s, that most diseases come from overeating. So a person needs to know that yes, it's a religion of the stomach and we celebrate all of our holidays with food, but also that when we eat, before we eat, it says to Galashem, everything belongs to God. How do we take it? By virtue of making a blessing. On the Shabbat, even without thinking about it, we elevate the food. But on a Yom Tov or a regular day, not only do we need to make a blessing, but we need to have in mind much like the Christians do where they say grace, that we need to actually articulate and say that we're using this food to give us the strength to be able to serve God. And we can do that with everything that we do and elevate those things that are mundane to the level of holy and to the level of mitzvah, not just with a blessing, but by using it and the strength of it to serve God better. Hopefully we'll look at food a little bit better and a little bit smarter and be able to walk away with a little bit of room left over. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a great Shabbos.